Okay, let's get going. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this session is You Suck at Email and Other Communication Challenges for the IT Professional. Uh, I know a lot of you have great options for the 130 session, so thank you for choosing uh, RISP and Air. Um, if you're in the wrong session, now's your chance to leave. Um, if you're just here to take a nap because it's uh, post lunch time, um, if you promise not to snore, we'll try to keep it down. Um, there we go. So, first, some introductions. Uh, my name is Jim Rispin. Uh, I was born in Canada, uh, but I grew up in the Midwest, and now I live in California. Uh, I'm the assistant director of IT at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I've clawed my way up the IT ladder from Apple sales rep to tech support grunt to sysadmin to now manager of other sysadmins, um, doing still sysadmin work. Um, in my younger days, I convinced two separate groups of people to both give me a degree in communications and put me on the radio. Um, now, I've filled out the same PSU speaker data sheet that all the other speakers filled out. Um, you guys filled this out, right? They're not just trolling me. Um, and if you scour that sheet, you'll notice that nowhere does it mention uh, communication expert. Because despite all of the above, uh, I am not an expert in any of this. Uh, and while I did play one on TV for a little while, it was on the CBC in Canada, so we know that doesn't really count. Um, so. All I'm doing is taking what I've learned over the years and digesting it down to bite-sized chunks for your enjoyment. So, in fact, really much of what we'll talk about today you could probably find in an afternoon of searching on LinkedIn. So, why are we here? Besides my obvious compulsion to point out the obvious and your desire for my useless crap sitting on this table. Well, we're here to talk about email. Why it sucks and why you might suck at it. Making your ideas accessible and why doing that is not the same thing as dumbing them down. The importance of building relationships in the real world and why having strong relationships might uh, cover your failures of communication and make them less obvious and painful. We will cover a brief, I say brief, primer on managing conflict in the workplace. And finally, we'll learn a little bit about the art of saying thank you. Here's some things we are not here to talk about. <laughs> so, let's get started. Yes, email sucks, but before we dive into that, uh, I have some questions for you. And I'm going to write the answers down for our audience at home who can't see them. So. First question. What is email to you? How do you define it? Just shout them out. I'll repeat them and write them down. Obnoxious. Obnoxious. Good. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I got one many two pages. <laughs> okay, now you're getting ahead of me. Okay, I heard obnoxious. Issue tracker. Time consuming. Sorry, I didn't hear that one. Disorganized. Overused. I like that. Nobody really needs to read these. Central? Essential. Essential. My customers think it's a file storage system. <laughs> okay. You get a prize for that one. Who said that? All right. T-shirt or other? Okay. Watch your head. There we go. Okay. So. We, okay. Uh, how do you use email? This is a, a little bit redundant, but we'll we'll uh, take these. How do you use email? Just respond. Respond. Okay. To-do list. To list. Notifications. Notifications. <laughs> Sorry. He already got the prize for that answer. As a way to avoid face-to-face communication. Ooh, good. When I need to cry. Okay, those last two get prizes. Those are good. <laughs> Who was that? 
I heard Nagel. Shirt or other. Okay. Proof? Ooh, okay. CYA, good. All right, who, was, who, who, who said the good cry? Shirt or other? Other. Okay, man, these others are going to go fast. You guys are going to have to do shirts eventually. <laughs> okay, how do others use email with you? Now, some again, some overlap, but maybe not. <laughs> Didn't hear that. Instant messaging. Instant messaging. I am. Okay. Quite poorly. Quite poorly. Quite poorly. I'm sorry, I got to switch markers. Hold on. Poorly. Profanely. Reply to. Okay. And abuse. Cry. Ooh. Chain of evidence. Yeah. Jen gets a prize for uh, the work on the weekend answer. Shirt or other? Okay. Going from the top. This has got to pass back. I'm not going to make it that far. Oh. Uh, we have that shirt? I can trade you out. I have many. See me after. We'll trade. Okay. Nice. Okay. Good. What's a reasonable response time for email? Commensurate with the issue at hand. Wow. Okay. That's a good answer. Commensurate with the issue at hand. All right. Whatever the sender thinks. Okay, so commensurate with the issue at hand, 24 hours, one working day. Anybody who thinks longer? Priority. Priority. I'm not giving you another prize for that. Um, priority. Okay. Show of hands. Who believes their boss expects them to check email after hours? Wow. Holy cow. That's depressing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Probably even worse, though, actually. Show of hands. Who expects their coworkers to check email after hours? Wow. Very interesting. Okay. I would give you all prizes for... Those of you who raise your hands that your boss is checked, but we'd run out really, really fast. So, but I feel bad for all of you. It's, that's not good. Okay. These answers raise some really interesting assumptions that some of us have in regard to email. So let's talk about some of the underlying philosophies of email. First of all, email is not your job. But just like meetings, as I mentioned last year, it is actual work and not something that prevents you from doing quote unquote real work. But because it can be disruptive, you have to decide when it's best to do email both at work and at home. Sometimes the problem is not email. Email gets a lot of scapegoating as the problem with all of our current communication woes at work. But sometimes it's about a failure of process. Poor procedure, ambiguous decision-making processes, or a failure of teammates to get what they need from one another can flood the tubes with email. This leads to falling behind in email which leads to more email. Now, email affects people both upstream and downstream. Your peers, your superiors, those that report to you, if they use it, no one is free of the potential negative impact that email can have. And email has its own cross-cultural reality. Now, what do I mean by that? I work in a place where there are literally dozens of cultures represented. So being sensitive to those differences is something I deal with daily. But even if in your, you're in a more homogeneous culture, people will still receive your email from the cultural bias that they represent. How will a recipient read what you wrote? Will they think it's too long or too short? Will they think it's too formal or too casual? Will they fail to understand your particular jargon or cultural references? As Pam Lefkowitz reminded us yesterday, 
in her talk, successful communication is not one-sided. So you need to keep in mind how the recipient will receive your message and learn to adapt your style to best fit the recipient of the message that you're sending. How you use email also communicates something to others about the kind of worker you are or person that you are. For example, by sending and responding to email after hours, you create a certain perception in the mind of the reader. On the positive side, if you're responding, you're diligent, you're hardworking, you're attentive, but you're also setting a certain precedent. Sure, feel free to write me on Saturday, I'll respond. On the negative side, if you're initiating the email, you're intrusive, disrespectful, lacking in boundaries. All of these are important considerations to realize when you're working with email. Now, let's not kid ourselves. Email is addictive, but there are the obvious sides of that addiction and the less obvious sides. <laughs> the more obvious side of the addiction is email makes us feel important. Who doesn't like getting the email from the president of your company asking for input on some important project? Email is one of the most available tools we have to impress our superiors and demonstrate our dedication, our hard work, and our ambition. But email is also stressful, which creates an inherent conflict. Bless you, Pam. A slight counter to this stress is your particular level of engagement in your job. A little throwback Thursday. Who remembers the statistic I quoted in my talk last year about the percentage of people who are actively engaged in their jobs? Anybody? You all fail. It's 30%. No prizes for you guys. If you're in that 30%, then you tend to experience less overall stress, even if you're checking email after hours. The other 70% of you are probably doomed to early stress-induced heart attacks. The less obvious side of this addiction is based on the science of how our brain works in response to modern email and its accompanying notifications. As my buddy Neil deGrasse Tyson says, let's drop some science in this house. I'm just, that's not to lie, he's not my buddy. <laughs> Each of us has in our brains a system for seeking pleasure called the dopamine system and a system for delivering that pleasure called the opioid system. We have a strong desire to seek out pleasure. In fact, our desire to seek pleasure is actually stronger than the satisfaction we receive when we find it. Your brain is more active when you are anticipating a reward than when you actually receive that reward. In general, dopamine is a good thing. It keeps us interested in the world around us, it's evolutionarily critical, and not just for things like keeping us alive and propagating the species like food and sex and etc., but for more abstract things like ideas and information. The problem comes when we get stuck in a dopamine-induced loop. Now, with the internet, we have at our disposal almost instant gratification for our desire to seek. Adding to that problem is the fact that the dopamine system doesn't have an automatic shutoff switch. It's possible for your brain to keep saying more, 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 even when you've already found what you're originally seeking. Another key is unpredictability. This also stimulates your dopamine system. Email shows up regularly, of course, but you never quite know when it's gonna hit or who it'll be from, and this is exactly what your dopamine system is eager for. Capping all of this off perfectly are the Pavlovian cues we've set up for ourselves. What is your most immediate response to the chirp or vibration coming from your pants? <laughs> <laughs> These are very specific cues that something is going to happen, and it sets off your dopamine system to start seeking. But constant stimulation of your dopamine system can be exhausting and hugely unproductive. So, what do we do? <laughs> I have a couple friends of mine, I have a couple friends of mine who literally put their phone in a box when they get home. That way, they're assured they don't fall prey to the enticement of responding to its flurry of notifications at a time when they wanna be focused on family or just relaxing. You could also consider taking an email sabbatical once a week or Set designated email times. Consider blocking out 30 minutes to an hour in your calendar specifically for email. <clears throat> Set selective notifications on your phone. Whatever you do, choose to not be a slave to your email. All right, all this philosophy is great, but how can we start to put some of these ideas into practice and challenge some of our previous assumptions about email? Well, the first thing you need to realize is that whatever you choose to do, email and likely the rest of the world will resist you. So you have to learn to protect yourself from your email. 
This is just going to play read, and I'm going to get a drink of water. <laughs> so, how do we begin to tame this monster? Well, we're going to take a stab at this in three steps. First, learn to manage the inflow of your email into your inbox by practicing good triage. Begin by permanently eliminating all the messages that you don't need to get that have previously chosen to receive. Facebook and Twitter updates, newsletters, etc. If you're getting this information in another venue, there's no need for it to clutter your inbox, blocking your view of more important <coughs> messages. Next, immediately delete what you never intend to read. And be ruthless. It may crush your grandmother's already fragile heart to know that you've deleted her weekly sewing circle newsletter, but if you're never going to read it, it has to go. Consider adopting a strategy of last in, first out, or first in, first out. Pick one, but stick to it. If you're someone who likes to scroll all the way to the bottom of your inbox and deal with your oldest messages first, great. Or if you prefer to hit the newest stuff as it comes in, that's great too. But be consistent and don't let yourself get distracted with other methods. This will help you get practiced at this part of triage, making it more efficient the more you do it. Make liberal use of the flag and star, allowing you to clear your inbox quickly, but then check those messages daily. I'm a heavy user of the starred message in Gmail, regularly going through my inbox and starring messages I want to get back to later, and then just archiving that message right, right out of my inbox. I'll then make a point of jumping into the starred message folder first when I sit down to actually work on email. I have a curated list of messages I can respond to right in front of me without having to filter through a bunch of other stuff I don't need to pay attention to. What I don't do is use my starred message folder as a to-do list because your inbox is not a to-do list. It's way too easy to lose track of things amidst all the other things getting dumped into your inbox for email to be remotely effective as a to-do app. Instead, forward those messages to a task manager, a sauna comes to mind, or manually move action items to a real to-do list that you can refer to later when you're doing non-email work. And speaking of other apps, make use of the tools available to you. I've been using Sanebox for about a year now, and it's been great. It's basically Gmail filters on steroids. It allows me to do a lot of what I would do with filters, but without the hassle of trial and error that comes with manual filtering. There are some nice additional features like Sane Black Hole that allows me to eliminate messages I don't want to bother unsubscribing <coughs> from. I just drop it in there, and I never hear from that sender again. Unroll.me is another great tool if you subscribe to a lot of newsletters or in the past have subscribed to a lot of newsletters. This combines newsletters you actually want to keep, those subscriptions that you want to read, into a daily digest and then unsubscribes you from all the other lists that you don't want to see anymore. Consider setting a pre-vacation message in your signature. 
If you know you're going to be out of the office, drop a note in your signature a few days to a couple of weeks ahead of time to let folks know. That way, they can get important stuff to you before you leave, potentially reducing the amount of email you receive while you're away and the number of messages you have to respond to when you get back. For example, this was my pre-vacation note in my signature for the last couple of weeks before coming to PSU. You'll also notice my test results were negative, which is good too. Moments of downtime are the perfect opportunity to do some message triage on your phone. Do a little star and archive in your, in your uh, inbox while you're waiting in line at the tattoo parlor, for example. By the way, this is the, I've seen this image probably hundreds of times, and this is the first time I've realized that monkey is clearly flipping off the cameraman. <laughs> You're welcome. Step two, adopt some best practices when writing email. Now, this one's been tough for me because I enjoy writing. I enjoy it when other people enjoy my writing. But I've had to learn that email is not necessarily the best venue for me to express my inner Hemingway. In addition, I've learned that there are some other best practices to consider when writing email. Respond quickly. Now. I'd say within 24 hours, some of you might disagree with me on that point. However, letting a message that requires a response languish in your inbox for two, three, four days, or even a week is just bad form. So reply quickly, whatever quickly means to you and your team, and not just a one res word response of got it. Okay, that's two words, but either fully respond or respond back briefly with a time when you'll get to the request in more detail. Here's a bonus for responding quickly. What does someone do who sent you an email and then not heard back from you in a couple of days? Send you an email. They send you another email. Asking if you got the first email, and then if you don't respond to that one, they send you another one. You have the power to eliminate that unnecessary email by simply responding in a reasonable time frame. Don't yell. Now, here I'm not talking about typing your messages in all caps. I trust everyone in this room knows the special level of hell reserved for those people. <laughs> No, I'm literally talking about not yelling at someone via email. Any kind of emotional exchange, reprimand, attempt at conflict resolution should not be handled via email. Email is no place for this kind of interaction. This is especially true if you're a manager. This kind of conversation should always be handled in person or at a minimum over the phone. There is just too much missing from email in the way of tone of voice, body language and the like for this ever to go well. Even if you don't think the message is particularly emotionally tinged, tread carefully when sending anything critical via email. What you thought was a simple reprimand to your staff for missing a staff meeting could be interpreted as getting torn a new one by the boss. Just do it in person. Don't blindly use BCC. Who can tell me when it's an appropriate time to use BCC? Letting the team know you took care of it? No. <laughs> Excellent prize for that. Shirt or other? Shirt, All right. You get Joker shirt. Oh, it's made. It. Yes, if you are sending a message to a large group of people who don't know each other, be respectful of their privacy and put everybody in the BCC line. But if you're sending a message to someone and you want to secretly include someone else, consider what you're doing. This kind of activity creates a culture of secrecy that can be very subversive to the morale and well being of your team. Now, that's not to say that there aren't times when using BCC in this fashion isn't appropriate, but just be sure you know why you're doing it and the reason it's valid. Full disclosure here. After uh, coming up with this topic and submitting it to PSU, I was doing some research in the area and actually discovered another presentation literally called You Suck at Email <laughs> from a couple of folks at Work Hacks that they published in 2012. So I did the only honorable thing I could do I stole some of their ideas. Um, <laughs> and the image from this slide, a little bit modified. My friends, we are knee deep in an epidemic of bad subject lines. Hallelujah, Sub sir. Thank you. <laughs> Preach it. Subject lines that give you no clue about the content of the message or the action required to make it go away. We can do better. Try this on for size. Try bracketing the critical information at the beginning of your subject line. Action, no action, FYI only. With modern email programs, you have quite a bit of length to work with in the subject line. So there is literally plenty of room for improvement. Even better, try this as an experiment. See if you can fit the entire content of your message into the subject line. 
For example, here, I just wanted to tell my team that I was going to be in late. I put in, be in the office at 9, and then the EOM indicates that it is the end of message. They don't even need to open it. Let's check out some other examples. Here is a series of messages I sent to my wife about a project she was helping me out on. You can see in the first subject at the bottom there that I was looking for some feedback from her regarding a particular design decision. So I put that clearly at the beginning of the subject line. Then I also indicated the name of the project and specifically what action I needed from her in response. So she knew before even opening the message what to expect and how to respond. The second message was dealing with some scheduling I needed to work out with her. So again, I indicated that at the beginning of the subject and then also added the specific event I needed to schedule with her. I also went the extra mile and listed the two options of times available for the event, all in the subject line. So she could reply to that message simply by indicating her time preference with no further action required. The last message <laughs> you can easily interpret based on all of our previous work with subject lines. And again, this is one she didn't even need to open because of the use of EOM at the end of the subject line. Now, I would ask one more thing of you before we move on from subject lines. If you see bad subject lines, don't just passively reply to them. Now that you know how, do everybody a favor and fix them before you send them. The next best practice has to do with how we write our email. As I said at the top of the section, I enjoy writing, but when it comes to writing email, we need to think more like Clark Kent and less like Stephen King. In other words, be a journalist, not a novelist. This starts with not burying the lead. Start with the important stuff and fill in the details as necessary. Consider the following message I might write to my CIO. Hey chief, hope your day is going great so far. I hope your vacation to Cancun last week was restful. Heard about that jellyfish thing to your privates. Ouch, bet that put a damper on things. I remember getting stung by one of those things when I was in Virginia Beach with my grandparents in 85. Not a good time, I can tell you. Well, just wanted to bring you up to speed on something we've got going down here in the bullpen. Our network just crashed and we are not likely to get it up <laughs> until next Wednesday. So you might want to let the executive team know. I buried the critical info in that message that should have been right at the top. Leaving the best stuff until the end is for novelists. So think King, sorry, think Kent, not King. Another key attribute of journalists is their critical need to be as brief as possible. This can also pay serious dividends in email. Before sending that message you just spent the better part of an hour writing, go back through and edit. Then go back through and edit again. Then go back through and edit again. If it's still longer than three paragraphs, edit again or pick up the phone. <laughs> Lastly, remember, brevity in email is not a license to be rude. Enough said on that one. The last weapon you want to add to your arsenal towards better email writing is prolific use of bullet points. Bullet points are a gift to your recipient. They make responding so much easier. Take, for example, the affirmation project my wife and I were working on recently. Rather than extolling the virtues of all of the alternative options I was considering in long paragraph prose, I put it in easy to read bullet points that she could scan and respond to quickly. Consider this the next time you have a series of things you're sharing via email, whether it's choices the recipient needs to select from or highlights from a staff meeting they missed, bullet points will be a welcome relief to long paragraphs of text. Yeah, I thought I'd get more laughs on that one. No? Okay. All of these things, better subject lines, thinking more like a journalist than a novelist, judicious use of bullet points, are an effort to help your reader understand exactly what you want from them when they receive your message. The less they have to guess at what you want, the more likely you are to actually get what you're asking for. Last step. Sorry, still in this. Lastly, when we talk about best practices for writing email, consider not writing the message at all. Don't do an email what you could do easier or clearer by phone or in person. Bonus tip number one. What about those times when you need to explain something in detail to convey important information to a large group of people, say your entire company? 
that's when it's time to worry less about brevity and consider breaking out your inner creative writer. However, even if you don't go the creative route, to convey complex or critical information, it's important that the information is still accessible. So many times when writing non-technical folks, we're either too technical or too boring, or both. Remember, making our ideas accessible is not the same as dumbing them down. So, how do you write so people will read? Here's an example of a message from our internal employee site. For a long time, we've done electronic waste collection throughout the year, but we had a hard time getting the message out to folks who seemed to be hoarding their old CRTs and busted fax machines. So I took the tact of wrapping the critical information in a fun message that I hope would draw their attention a little bit better. Well, we've established a bit of a reputation for quirky messages now, but the whole community gets when IT sends out something. It'll be a little bit interesting to read, but the critical information is still here for anybody who wants to just skip through it. Um, the rest of the message is designed to draw you in and make, help you remember that critical information. <clears throat> this is one that we posted to notify folks of a network down day. Um, again, critical information in bold for anyone who really didn't want to read the rest of the message. But the larger message, again, is designed to draw you in to help you remember the really critical elements of the information. Interesting note um, for this here, uh, for those of you who think Google is all powerful, they completely failed to provide me an image of a hamster riding a unicorn. <laughs> I, had, I had to create that from scratch. So now it's out there. Yes, thank you. You're welcome, Google. <laughs> Bonus tip number two. Have a little fun with your out-of-office message. I've been doing this for a little while, and it hasn't gotten me fired yet. Here's my out-of-office message for this week. I'm going to drink some water. But. <laughs> okay, let's move on. If you really want to read this, you can just email me. <laughs> Another full disclosure, though. I'm, I'm pretty clever, I like to think, but uh, I actually can't take credit for that one. Uh, I borrowed it from a site of a fellow Canadian um, who uh, has almost six years of out-of-office messages for you to either enjoy or borrow for yourself. He stopped doing it last year, I guess possibly because his boss got tired of his antics and just fired him, but um, he's made it clear that you're free to copy, paste, and edit any of the messages you like to your heart's content. So if any of these get you fired, well, buyer beware, you know. Okay, now we're at our last step of taming the beast, managing the outflow with courtesy. We've talked about this a couple of times already, but know what you should and should not handle via email. Things like long policy discussions, difficult or emotionally volatile conversations should be handled in a different venue. Have you ever received one of those messages from a colleague that just demanded a good old fashioned smackdown? <laughs> no. Yeah. Feels good to write those emails, right? You are justified in every single word that puts them in their place, but then you send it and immediately regret it. What if next time you got one of those boneheaded messages, uh, you tried something a little different? Go ahead, write the email, but then put it in the icebox for the night. That's what we like to call it. Write it, save it to your drafts, go home, have a beer, play with your kids, destroy some junior hire in Call of Duty, whatever it is you do to relax. Then come back the next day and reread that message. Chances are you'll feel differently about the need to send it as is. But even if you still do still feel the need to send it, have somebody else you trust give you an unbiased read before sending it, especially if it's still emotionally tinged. Remember, email is forever. Despite all the things that tell us you can unsend things, Google being one of them, uh, every word in that message may be completely justified, but it could still come back to haunt you in ways that you don't expect. This is a, a recently developed personal pet peeve of mine. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I have horrible boundaries when it comes to writing email after hours. But that doesn't mean my bad habits need to affect those around me. For example, a couple of months ago, my general habit is to, when I think of something, throw it into an email and send it. I needed some changes on our firewall from our network admin, shot it out, it was 8 o'clock at night on a Thursday, I don't know what it was. Ten minutes later, I get a response back from him asking, do I need this now? Holy cow, no. I just disrupted his family time with his wife like an ass. 
And so I needed to change, not necessarily my habits, but the tools that I could use that still allowed me to have my questionable boundaries with work email, but not impact those around me. So if you have a habit of sending emails to your colleagues after hours, whether they're peers, subordinates, or supervisors, cut it out in the way that, that I'm describing that I just described. Perpetuating this culture of always on, always available is bad for all of us. Now, that's not to say that you have to curb those bad habits, as I don't plan to curb mine. Um, I'm still planning to write all those emails after hours, but they're not going to affect my team because I'm making use of the tools available to me. I've been using Boomerang for about as long as I've been using SaneBox. It's available to anybody who uses Gmail in a limited capacity. You can send a limited number of messages through Boomerang each month. I actually pay for the service because I need to feed a much larger habit. But it allows me to write messages whenever I like and schedule them to send out at any point in the future, usually 7 a.m. the next morning, 5 a.m. if I'm really trying to impress somebody. If you don't want to pay for Boomerang, just do the poor man's version and save your messages to the drafts folder and then send them the next morning when you're in the office. This is a handy feature that only used to be available as a lab, but if it is now a full featured option on Gmail. If you have Gmail and you're a user of Gmail, go ahead, turn this on right now. We'll wait, because it is brilliant. Turn it on, set it to the maximum allowable time, which is 30 seconds. Pray you never need to use it, but be glad it's there if you do. Again, this is another perfect opportunity to use your smartphone. Because as a culture, we're more forgiving of messages we receive from mobile devices, indicated by the handy sent from a mobile device signature we've created. You can get away with quick messages that appear more abrupt or suffer from bad grammar. Now, whether or not you choose to use the mobile signature in your regular email to get away with the same thing is not for me to judge. <laughs> so I want to stop here and see if there are any questions on email before we move on to other topics. Sir. You mentioned, uh Again, Boomerang, uh, that is a good question. Boomerang can, can adjust for that if you're using, uh, it'll adjust for time zone, I believe. I might be wrong on that one. Um, so you think you should still try to get I think it's still uh, courteous to your teams that live in different time zones. Um, now, whatever you know, uh, agreement you've made with the rest of your teammate, if, you know, if somebody's in New York and you're in LA, um, there's going to be some uh, times when you're sending messages that they're off and vice versa. Um, if there's an agreement to that, that's one thing. But, and that's kind of what I was getting at with my, my example to my team member was there had never been a spoken word of whether or not we would allow or expect people to be responding to email after hours. But if your boss is sending you something, there's that expectation that's set, whether or not you're aware of it. Um, and as a regular employee, if you're responding to emails, as I said earlier, you're again setting that expectation that it's okay to communicate with you after hours. So just be aware of, of the unspoken part of it. If it's an agreement that's openly made, that's one thing. But be conscious of it, I think, is the point. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. How do you find a balance on the part about putting all the important reassuring stuff in and what do you find a balance between that and people who put a hurt word in something? Well, sorry for the readers at home. Uh, he asked, how do you find a balance between um, putting all of the things in the subject um, and the people who will put a bazillion things in the subject that may or may not be relevant? The key there is the relevancy. So um, finding the critical pieces of information, if it's, if it's something that needs to get acted on, you put action in, that, in the, the, the brackets in that, that subject line. Make the subject line work for you. Don't just blindly use it uh, as another space for email because you've run out of space in the larger, box, the larger text box. Um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of being judicious and being strategic uh, about the information you're putting in the subject line Think of, uh, think of it from the reader's perspective. When they read the, the subject line, is it going to achieve the goal that you want, which is to make the whole email process happen more efficiently? Any other questions? Great. Uh, I'm just curious, <clears throat> and some of the tips that you were talking about in terms of you know, managing the, your, the flow of the email and, and triaging and that sort of thing. I'm curious if other people um, are doing something that, that that I am doing, which I might be bad, but I'm doing it anyway. I, I treat my email inbox more like a compost heap. <laughs> <laughs> so the stuff on top, it hasn't rotted yet, and it's, it's important, I'll deal with that. But as the stuff gets lower, I, I ignore it. So I don't actually clear out my, I've never been at inbox zero for mm -hmm. 
years and years and years and years because it's just too much work. Sure. You know, so I'll just ignore that stuff down at the bottom. And, and because Gmail doesn't really give me any limits, I don't have to clean that stuff up. True. I don't bother. True. There is a certain, and I'm not a, a believer in Inbox Zero either because I think it's, a, it's an arbitrary kind of uh, false sense of achievement, really. Because um, email is endless. It's going to keep coming to kind of to continue to, to achieve some sort of um, panacea of uh, no messages in your inbox. Just because like you'd be making shortcuts and exceptions to a lot of things to get to that zero. Specific to your point of using it as a compost heap, there is a certain, I think, philosophy of if you ignore a message long enough, it will resolve itself. Um, which is certainly true in some cases and is, is, I think, a valid way to approach email depending on who's sending it to you, frankly. Um, but I think the danger there is losing track. If you, if you have the compost heap and something that actually is important gets sort of stuck down in the middle and you lose track of it, um, that could create uh, a ripple effect for you that would be a, a negative consequence. So if you, if you combine that with trying very hard to respond to an email within a day or so. Sure. Then that's less likely. You can mitigate that. Down there, it's, it, it's stuff that's in the middle is not, something. yeah, but it's not that important. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. If uh, email got over a certain length, it might be better to call on the phone. Sure. So, uh, would it be appropriate because I, sometimes when I call my um, employees on the phone, they don't record all the details, you know, so they don't follow through? Sure. Exactly how I want it. Absolutely. So, the question is would it be appropriate rather than if your email is too long, if the initial email is too long? to make that call to the employee to sort of have that discussion, but then follow up with a bullet pointed email. That's a brilliant way to do it, actually. I mean, that's, that's an effective use of communication because you're having the conversation in a venue that's much more conducive to that conversation if it's too long. But then you're making use, really effective use of email to sort of reinforce that conversation in a very concise way. So that's a great way to do it, sure. One more question, then we're just gonna move on. Oh, two more questions, then we'll move on. All right, three. Well, I'll go. try to slip two in. Okay, go. A comment and a, a question, and I don't know if it's still true, but if you're using an exchange rig, I find a lot of customers that have done, they've tried to organize, but they've made a bunch of subfolders in the inbox, and the fetch rate on the inbox is much more frequent than mm -hmm. a not subfolder to an inbox. So just sure. Point there. And then I was wondering in your square bracket concept, are you aware of anybody that's trying to standardize? I mean, I wish. Sort of know ANN in all caps and square brackets means announcement? Yeah, I wish. Person? For me, I, I think know. it's. I want to train them to an arbitrary standard. No, no, I know. I think uh, for me, it's sort of an effort to do it in a, in a small microcosm kind of way. So um, I'm trying to create a nomenclature with my own team that we all understand because that's, you know, that's likely the people you're communicating with most and where you can have, I think, the most impact and the most uh, real benefit from any sort of change in how you do email as a team. Um, so defining that for the people you work most frequently with is probably going to give you the best bang for your buck. Um, but I haven't seen any, any, you know, maybe enough of this gets viral or what have you. There may be some, some groundswell of certain terminology, but I haven't seen anything. Go ahead. So I was wondering, because um, I think everyone gets these, but you get like a flurry of emails and then on the ones you don't get to, you get like the reply that says, oh yeah, I figured it out. You right. You have like a, a time frame or a... a guide that you use for like, what's a good time to wait to let someone... Yeah, again, I think that's more of a personal choice. Um, again, his question was, is there a window in which you can kind of ignore a message with the hopes that it will resolve itself? Um, and I think that's true. Certainly in tech support, I think that's a valid uh, approach. Um, I would say maybe a business day, so give it 8 to 12 hours maybe, um, and if it resolves itself, maybe then, or you could even have the advantage of I hesitate to say ignore those and let them resolve themselves because if that happens too much, you create sort of a culture of non-response. Um, even if the problem isn't really uh, significant, if somebody sends you, say your tech support, somebody sends a tech support request to you, you wait the requisite 8 to 12 hours for it to resolve itself, and it does, and they still don't hear from you, uh, maybe better to do, even if you know that it's been resolved or are questioned whether it's been resolved, do a follow-up so you're kind of creating that communication loop so they trust that they're Messages aren't going into a black hole. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, sort of a customer service layer there that, that maybe plays into it. So. That, like, is it bad to respond with, like, the, let me Google that thing for you? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think it, uh, his question was, um, is it bad to respond with, let me Google that for you? Um, there's an app for 
Yeah. Again, I think that's that's more of a customer service question. It depends on who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with some, if you're dealing with your your you know your cousin or your aunt, sure, by all means, you know, use that to your heart's content. If you're dealing with somebody in your company who has an expectation that you're providing a service, probably not a good tack to take. Pam. Um, Pam's question is, what do you do with the email that you get that has those, you know, really valuable tidbits of information that you don't want to lose? Um, again, I'll kind of go back to email is not a file storage system. Um, it's not designed for that. Even though Google, you know, says that their search algorithm is, you know, second to none, um, that's not what email was ever designed for. Um, and that stuff just gets lost because honestly, you'll forget what, you know, what it was that was relevant so that you would even forget how to search for it. Um, so I would, I would use a different um, mechanism for saving that data. Evernote's a great idea um, because they do a lot better search. There's, there's you know, just in terms of, of how they're, um, well, I would say just by virtue of the fact that you can tag it in a, in a certain way within Evernote um, makes it a, a more valuable retrieval tool than email would ever be. So, okay, let's move on. Let's talk briefly about the value of building relationships outside of the digital realm. Okay, who here, uh, by show of hands, gets out of the office at least once a week to have coffee with someone in their company with no specific agenda? You don't want anything from them. Wow, I was hoping for more. Okay. Um, okay, of those of you who raised your hands, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot. Uh, who can name a hobby of someone who works in their company but not in their office? Uh, these two guys. Okay, and? Prize for both of you. Shirt or other? They're all large because this is my own personal stash. I'm not a vendor. So, <laughs> as I tell my kids, you get what you get. It's your own personal stash? Have they been worn? No, they've not. <laughs> but that's an excellent question. Really good question. All right, there you go. Okay. Um, there is real value in getting to know the people in your company who you wouldn't otherwise come in contact with on a regular basis. You never know when you might need them, and you will be surprised at what you'll learn by getting out and just meeting folks. Also, ask the people that you regularly work with, both inside and outside of your team, to coffee with no specific agenda, that you don't need anything from them. So that when it com comes time to work together on a project, the time you've spent together just in that no agenda time will make the whole project go that much smoother. One of the things that I've been doing with my team, uh, especially my new hires recently, is sending them out on a scavenger hunt. This gets them out of the office, meeting people they don't regularly meet, and learning things about the campus that they might not otherwise learn. Now, this is not an easy hunt, I'll tell you that. Um, I usually give them about a month to complete this, uh, and they get points for each item that they complete with various prizes at the end based on the total points that they've earned. It serves double duty, though, because in addition to sort of getting them out, helping them learn about the campus, um, it also makes IT appear more approachable. Um, rather than only seeing IT when something's gone horribly wrong, um, this gives the rest of the campus a chance to interact with my team in a much more low-key and fun way. Um, again, sort of paying dividends uh, when, when it comes time for them to actually reach out to IT for a serious issue. So um, you'll be able to read that better in the slides when you get them. In the interest of improving on relationships um, we already have, though, here's an experiment you can try that will not only build on trust, but give you some valuable insights as to how your colleagues see you. I went through a manager training this last year uh, at my work, and one of the things we worked on was something called a Jahari window. Anybody heard of it? Cool. The title of an, an X so. Really? Other than that, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, who said they'd heard of that? Prize for both of you. Shirt or other? All right, other? Other. Okay, this has got to pass back. I'm not throwing these. Just pass it back. Just pass it back. All right. So the basic concept behind it is to provide you with information on how you are perceived by those around you. 
The Jahari window is made up of four quadrants. In each quadrant are characteristics or qualities that you possess, organized by how they are known to you and those around you. You can see those quadrants and what they represent here. So there's open, hidden, blind, and unknown. So your homework after this session, or after the conference if you like, is to develop your own Jahari window. Here's how you do it. Step one, you define yourself. Pick five or six adjectives that you think describe you best. And these are the ad adjectives that they're working with. You don't have to kind of come up with your own. Again, you can read these in the slides. So pick five or six, put those aside. Now, reach out to several of your colleagues whose opinion that you trust and ask them to do the same. Now, keep it to no more than 10 for simplicity's sake, but uh, also if you can find a way to anonymize this, you'll get a lot more honest feedback. Uh, if Bob down the hall wants to tell you that he thinks you're impatient and boastful, he's much more likely to do it if he knows he can do it anonymously. Even if you tell people to be honest with you, no one's really gonna risk hurting somebody's feelings to their face if they can avoid it. So you'll get a lot more honest feedback if you can do it anonymously. One way to do that is just using a Google form that doesn't record username or email. Now that you have all of your responses, you fill out your window. So words that both you and your peers chose go in the open box. Words you chose but your peers didn't go in the hidden box. And words your peers chose, sorry, I said that wrong. Words you chose, but your peers didn't, yes, go in the hidden box. Words that your peers chose, but you did not, go in the blind box. And obviously nothing goes in the unknown box because, well, it's unknown. Um, I'll step back real quick, so that's, does that, is that clear to everybody? So things that you know about yourself and that other people know about you, go here. Things that you know about yourself but no one else really knows, go here. Things that you're projecting to other people that you're not aware of, go here. Okay? Now the real work begins. Analyze the results. Start with the blind box. What are you projecting that you're not aware of? Some will likely be good things. Maybe you'll be surprised to learn that people find that you're mature and wise, probably because they don't know that you still wear Batman underoos. <laughs> If so, lean into those traits and trust your instincts in those areas. But you're just as likely to learn about things you're projecting that you're not so happy about. Even if you don't understand how someone could see you as impatient and unapproachable, the fact is they do, and it's up to you to change that perception. So that was really brief, but that's kind of the extent of it. And it, Super helpful. Again, if you can get honest feedback from colleagues that you trust, it will really be eye-opening as to how you are projecting yourself to your team and to the community around you. So any questions on the Jahari window before we move on? Who here thinks they're going to try it? Cool. All right. Let's talk conflict. First, um, tell you a joke. Guy comes home from work, comes up onto his porch, and he glances down and he sees a tiny little snail on uh, his favorite plant. This is a bonsai tree that he's cultivated since childhood. It's a gorgeous thing. Little snail kind of crawling on one of the branches. It kind of bothers him a little bit, but he doesn't think much about it. Goes inside. Next day he comes home, comes up on his porch, glances down, sees the same snail, pretty much in that same spot on his tree. Again, a little annoyed because he really likes the tree, but doesn't really do anything about it. Goes inside. This goes on for several days, leading into weeks. Comes home, sees the same snail. Finally, he comes home one day, and he's kind of had a crappy day. Um, walks up on the, the steps and, and, again, sees that same snail in the same spot on the tree. Grabs the snail, chucks it as hard as he can over the house into the backyard. Ten years later, he's coming home from work, walks up onto the porch, sees the exact same snail in the exact same spot it was 10 years ago. Snail looks up at him and says, what was up with that? <laughs> that is exactly how your colleagues feel when you surprise them with conflict. This is where our efforts in relationship building can really begin to pay off. Quick show of hands. Who gets along with their teammates and boss all of the time? All of the time. You are such liars, all of you. <laughs> given no prizes for that. <laughs> None of us are perfect. 
We all have things that rub people the wrong way and vice versa. The key is knowing how to handle those issues without creating more stress and larger issues for everyone on the team. To that end, here is my guide to managing office conflict. Keep in mind, this is not a full-blown session, but just a primer. So set your expectations accordingly. We'll see if we can do this under five minutes. To start, know when not to engage in conflict resolution. Are you angry? Remember that icebox we created for our email? Create one in the real world, too. Are you hungry? Is the source of your frustration openly weeping at his desk right now? <laughs> Is your entire office being evacuated due to an anthrax scare or some similar emergency? If you answered yes to any of these, might not be a good time to engage in conflict resolution. But if you answered no, go for it. Rule number one, there are no winners in conflict resolution. You have to enter into it with the attitude of finding common ground and resolution, not coming out on top. Rule number two, keep to the facts and do your best to remove strong emotion from the equation. One of the reasons conflict resolution usually fails is we get caught up in the emotion of our frustration and forget the facts of what's actually frustrating us about the other person. When we approach our colleagues with only the emotion of our frustration and they ask for details, you draw a complete blank because you are so caught up in your emotions. Also, don't assume that you know everyone's position or perspective. It's entirely possible you've completely misinterpreted the situation and just need to hear it from the perspective of someone else, which is why you don't resolve conflict with words, you resolve it with your ears. The more you listen, the more the other person will feel heard and the more they will be willing to hear you. If you listen long enough, you might even discover that you were wrong. Step four. Don't give up, and don't walk away unless you're about to explode on somebody. But agree to give each other the freedom and grace to continue working on the issue. Don't assume you'll immediately solve the conflict in one sitting. Agree to give each other the freedom and grace to revisit the issue as necessary. Say, for example, I work with Brian back here, and Brian says to me, you have got to stop pulling my chair out from under me when I go to sit down. <laughs> I'll say, all right, it's funny, but because I love you, I'll try to stop doing that. But you may need to remind me a couple more times. This gives Brian the freedom to bring up this frustration without the emotional intensity of the first time, and it gives me the grace to screw up a few more times before the change in behavior finally sets in. Remember, it's about resolution, not winning. So find ways to compromise that don't require 100% agreement. Ultimately, you want to be remembered as the person who worked through the conflict for the benefit of the whole team, rather than the person who always had to be right. Boom, under five minutes. Any questions on conflict resolution? That was super short. Or just comments or questions. Anybody done what they feel like is successful conflict resolution with their team? For real? One guy, that's a prize, dude. Shirt or other, all right. Ninja shirt or cat shirt? Uh, I don't know, the cat shirt's pretty cool, all right. All right. Okay, let's put a bow on all of this with a little reminder about saying thank you. Why bother? Well, Jim, you might say, why should I have to say thank you to somebody for doing their job? Isn't that what they get paid for doing? Well, sure, if your goal is to win ass of the month, by all means, you know, don't say thank you. But, assuming you're a person in possession of an actual heart, saying thank you can still be a little tough. Sometimes it's easier to say nothing than to risk saying thank you in the wrong way. But that just means we'll all mope around feeling underappreciated or missing the impact that our work has on others. Saying thanks is the required end to the relationship building we talked about earlier. It solidifies the trust you've established and makes the relationship that much stronger. Remember, nobody can read your mind. If you appreciated something someone did at work, you have to tell them or they won't know. So, how do you say thank you to your boss? Well, only do it when it really matters. Otherwise, it just looks like sucking up. Be direct, 
Be truthful, be concise, and be sincere. It's not your job to build up your boss. See, sucking up. Make the connection between what they did and what you got because of it. Say, Chris is my boss here. I can say, hey, Chris, thanks for including me in that conference call with Richard Branson. I was amazed at your negotiation tactics. I can't believe you got him to give us that island. And Chris will say, thank you. Special note, tread carefully when thanking your boss with gifts. Even buying coffee for your boss can create an awkward dynamic which could interfere with your intended goal of thanking them. It's usually best to say with words. How do you say thank you to your peers? Again, only do it when it really matters. Doing it too much can make you seem insincere. But be casual and concise. Thank them for something specific, not just for being extremely cool, unless you work with this guy. <laughs> only speak for yourself, not the whole team or someone else. Offer to return the favor, but then don't wait for them to ask. Actively seek out ways that you can help them proactively. How to stay thank you to your employees. <laughs> That's not it. Now, if you supervise other people, this should be a no-brainer. This should be a regular part of your interactions with your team. But again, don't overdo it or be too general or it'll be perceived as insincere. Tailor it to the person and tie it to a specific accomplishment or incident. Be sure they understand that you appreciate on a personal level, not just the, for the good of the company. And make the most of the opportunity to achieve your desired effect. If you want to build them up in front of their peers, thank them publicly at a meeting or just somewhere else where everyone else is around. If you want to demonstrate how much value that you have in them and how much you trust them, do it personally over lunch or coffee. Remember, saying thank you looks like this, sometimes like this, not like this. <laughs> Regardless of who you're thanking, make sure it's a regular part of your interactions with your team. The more you do it, the more natural it'll become, and the more appropriate it will feel for others around you to do it as well. So, to close, we've covered a lot, fairly quickly, but let me advise patience. Be patient with yourself, with your teammates, should you actually try to encourage those around you towards better communication. All of the things that we've talked about, from email to conflict to building relationships, really take time and you have to be patient. With that, thank you for listening. I'll take any more questions. We have 13 minutes. Yes, in the back. If you want to make it to the microphone, it's all the way up here, closer to the prizes in case you get a good one. But. Oh, <laughs> your boss ignores all your emails? That could be a sign you're about to get fired. <laughs> no. They're replacing you while you're gone. Um, do you meet regularly with your boss? Like in person? Um, have you raised that with him? Honestly, with me, I'd just be upfront about it. Um, but that's just my style. Uh, if, if I've got an issue with somebody, I tend to not bury it or be passive aggressive about it. I'll just, you know, bring it up in, you know, obviously in a, in a respectful way, but say, or just ask him sort of a, a bit of an open-ended question. Are there better ways for me to communicate with you when I need to, to convey some information? Um, is e because email maybe isn't, you know, maybe I'm getting lost in the shuffle of all your other email. I recognize that you're busy. Is there a better way for me to communicate with you? Might be an option. All the way in the back. Mm. That bugs me. Am I alone? Like it seems yeah. like they, they've chosen to expand the audience. I chose the recipients, but in a lot of cases, it keeps expanding and expanding. Sure. Because they think, not me, the guy who starts the thread, they think the thread needs to grow to a bigger audience. Sure. I so, think that is a little bit of a violation of protocol. For the audience at home, his challenge is he creates a thread of a, a particular group of people, and um, the people within that thread take it upon themselves to expand the thread to other people, which bothers him. Anybody else in, in uh... well, can, I, can I get a counterpoint? Sure. Uh, in a large corporation, you don't always know the best recipient. So if I'm asking some, a group of people a question, maybe one of them knows a better recipient. Right. So, That's an excellent point. Yes. So I think his point of 
Sometimes you don't know everybody who might be a, a worthwhile contributor to the conversation, and there are others who, who could see value in adding other folks. I can also see your point of if you intended this to be a private conversation um, to the recipients who were initially contacted, maybe you want to make that clear at the beginning of the message. Um, again, I'm, I'm one for being open and straightforward with people. Um, if it's sort of a cultural thing, that's a different issue because that kind of thing is slow to change. Um, if it's you know if it's one or two people that are doing it uh, again approach them in person maybe um, ask them why uh, ask them if you know if uh, there can be sort of a uh, I hate to use this word gentleman's agreement of you know who you're going to include at the beginning of a conversation like that just ideas I'm just following here I just want to comment that a short handwritten note card is really effective to say thanks to somebody excellent yes short handwritten is key to that. Note card is super effective. I, I used to make a habit of, uh, I got some uh, series of just crazy, stupid, funny postcards. And whenever I'd have a positive interaction with somebody, I'd just jot them a quick uh, thank you note on one of the postcards and drop it in our campus mail. Um, has a super uh, strong effect of making a connection with someone in a very unique way. You know, you could say thank you in email. I don't recommend it, um, as, a, as clearly. It's still saying thank you. It's better than nothing. Um, but it doesn't take really much to you know, jot down a few thank you words on a, on a note and you know, drop it in the mail. Fair enough. Excellent point. No, from a, from a gender perspective, that's a very good point. So again, sort of back to the very beginning, know the cultural realities in which you live. Sorry, her comment was it can come across as creepy sometimes, which I think from if there's cross-gender um, thank yous that happen, which again was why I said sometimes for this, don't just go hugging people to thank them if, yeah. So I'm not encouraging this. Be aware of your, again, be aware of your recipient. Um, but that's, that's an excellent point. Be aware of the cross-cultural realities. Aw, <laughs> little man love down here in the front. Uh, be aware of the cross-cultural realities that you, that you live within and don't violate those uh, either knowingly or unknowingly. You're right here. Ooh. Sure, sure. Um, her question is, if you have a conflictual interaction with somebody over the phone or in person, do you follow that up with email just to sort of do a CYA? Um, I think it depends on your position. Um, speaking as a manager, um, if I have a particular conflict with one of my staff members, I'm trying to correct a behavior, absolutely, I will follow it up with an email. It's both beneficial for them to remind them what we've agreed on, and it, it creates that, that uh, layer of documentation that I may need it to refer back to if things go poorly. So, in the back. Sure. His uh, question is, if you have a series of options that you're, you're presenting to someone for their selection, doing it in prose, you may not get the response you want. Um, they may kind of miss something or blow past it. But doing it in bullet point can sometimes feel robotic. Um, I don't necessarily agree with you on that particular point because I think um, email itself is sort of... Uh, uh, vacant of emotion, really. Um, even when we uh, uh, want it to be there, sometimes it's not. So, or it can be when you don't want it to be. But um, I think the value of the bullet point in terms of if you're looking for something specific from someone in terms of a response, doing it in a bullet form, I think, is, is really beneficial to both of you because um, they can easily see what their options are without having to filter through a lot of pros um, that may obscure uh, the actual selections that you want them to choose from. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe you're, you have different experience. I wouldn't receive that as robotic. So um, I don't know that you need to, to strike a middle ground there necessarily. Question here. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I think really, sorry, her question is what do you do when the people you're dealing with actually perceive brevity just by virtue of itself as rude? Um, uh, 
I think you can mitigate that a little bit with very basic uh, intros and salutations, honestly. Um, it doesn't take but an extra three seconds to put the person's name at the beginning of the email and either a sincerely or a thanks or a yours. Although I read an article recently that people use best a lot to close their emails and it doesn't make any sense. Um, anyway, but I think specific to your point, I think you can mitigate that a little bit. You can still be brief, but if you go to the extra effort of actually kind of using their name and putting a, 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 a closing in it could probably um, eliminate that perception that you're being rude. Uh, again, just spitballing, so. What's the best way to kind of address the length of somebody's emails? Like, we have one guy. That you're receiving, you mean? Yeah. We have one guy on our team. He, I'm looking at one now, and it's like, <laughs> It's pretty long, and then he attaches another message, so it just makes it longer. So it's like yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. What do you? His question is, what do you do uh, uh, as the recipient of someone who just is way long-winded in their emails? Um, I don't know that I agree with your point of you know TLDR. No, no, no. I get it. I get you. I get you. Because again, that would potentially appear rude just to address it. Um, but I would say um, model good behavior for him would be one place I would start. So if, if you can have the conversation with the rest of your team to say, here's how we're going to do email. We're going to try and keep it to three paragraphs and no longer. If everybody's doing that and those are the only messages he's receiving, might begin to sink in that that's how you want to communicate as a team. Again, have the conversation in person to say, some of this might be better held in a different venue rather than trying to, you know, approach them in, in a very positive way to say, all your information is great. I don't think I'm getting the full context of it in email. Could we maybe try doing that in a meeting or if we could have coffee together and you could tell me about it? Rather than chastising him for writing messages that are too long, you want to encourage him in the information he's trying to convey, but encourage him to do it in a different format maybe. So, Chris. So one of the trends that seems like it's kind of salient is the assumption that email is not fixable. And that what you should do is you should use this particular communication tool instead, whether that is going to be, we should communicate these things via Twitter, we should communicate these things via HipChat, via Slack, via what have you. You should move things out into a ticket system. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to a solution as changing tools? Hmm. I, uh, Chris's question is, uh, there's, a, there's a growing perception that email is broken, um, uh, inextricably broken, um, and that because of that, there have been folks who have tried to move that style of communication or uh, something similar to Twitter or chat or um, just different venues and, and how successful that may or may not be. Um, I don't really have a good response to that, to be honest. Within our team, he asked if we've worked with any of that. Um, within our team, we make heavy use of Google Chat um, for when you need that sort of immediate response. Um, I'm also encouraging my team to get off their get off their butts and go talk to people. We don't, you know, our campus isn't that big. Uh, at least our main campus isn't that big. It's more challenging. We have six regional campuses around the country. So when you're communicating with those folks, it's email, phone, or chat, basically. Though another benefit is G Chat or uh, uh, video chat. Um, sort of gives, again, it sort of mitigates what's missing in email in terms of tone of voice and body language. It's still not a, you know, the same as being in the room with somebody because there's, there's cues you pick up there as well. But it does help to kind of um, bridge that gap for certain kinds of communication when distance is an issue. Um, but yeah, for us, we're, we're, we haven't landed on the perfect solution. We do use uh, chat a lot for the IT team to kind of convey things that are uh, uh, urgent in nature. Um, and rely less on email. I tend to use email um, less for long-winded communication, those are for meetings, and more for just sort of uh, quick reminders or um, things that aren't necessarily time sensitive. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the team. So I don't, I don't know that I have a good silver bullet for that one. Yeah. What do you think of the, um, the Merlin Man GTD style email flurries, the I'm only doing email the first 10 minutes of every hour type of approach. Um, I've, I've seen managers that are like all in for that. Right, and right. Others that like, no, I want instant. Sure. Um, so his question is, what do I think about the Merlin Mann uh, technique of, of doing email for like the first 10 minutes of each hour? 
Um, again, I think it's a personal choice. Uh, what works for you? What I think you can't do is dictate how other people should do email. Um, again, all of these are suggestions. I'm not telling anybody this is exactly how you should do email. These are suggestions. Um, find what works for you. If um, For me, I'm imminently interruptible. I don't mind, actually. So I'm kind of in and out of email through the day. Um, but I know uh, guys in my team who will literally just, like I mentioned, block out an hour of time, and that's the only time they do email. Um, if you're doing that, though, I would say it's probably worthwhile to encourage or to let your team know that that's how you're doing email. Um, so they don't have an expectation that if they email you uh, after 10 o'clock and your time block for doing email is 9 to 10, they're not going to hear, hear from you until the next day. So make sure that that's clear. So we are out of time. Before you applaud, before you applaud, <laughs> there's about 75 people out there waiting for the next session, maybe more. If you're planning on staying for the next session, it's the open source uh, free versus battle cage, steel cage match. As soon as you're staying, I will say I'm very disappointed in all of you. I was hoping somebody's phone would go off during the session because I had this prize saved for that person.